The following production is part of the We Be Geeks Podcast Collective. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. The dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Yes, hello. I am here and I am back with you a little later than I anticipated, but I am back here with you to have some more fun to talk about some more news going on in the world of entertainment and uh, the passing of uh, a very important actor, Michael Gambone, who I'm sure is important to a lot of us in the uh, in the community. Uh, also, I've got a lot of trailers to discuss with you, and uh, this is a show that uh, it's been two weeks in the making. I have an interesting story, at least to tell y'all. I was supposed to have gone camping, okay? Uh, you remember me saying that last episode? Okay, won't have an episode next week. Uh, we're going on a camping trip. Well, right before we were supposed to go camping, we have a cat that uh, got ill, uh, and we took her to the vet. They uh, did an ultrasound on her. Apparently, did not fully diagnose her with a UTI. Just treated her for a UTI. Uh, and of course, with all the stuff they did, it cost us all the money we'd saved up for going camping on and even took all our money I've been saving for going to Silver Dollar City. It's expensive taking your pet to the vet and when they do a lot of tests. And so we ended up not going camping, but uh, trying to take care of the cat and everything. I didn't get a a show uh, recorded anyway. And though I thought, well, maybe I could. But uh, this is also, we've gone into this week here. Uh, I'm preparing... For a procedure, we'll just we'll just say that it's something that uh, I, I actually the funny thing is a lot of uh, podcasts here lately have been talking about this uh, that I listen to that uh, one of their male hosts is close to my age or whatever or a little older and I've gone in for this particular procedure where I'm now today as we record this or as I record this I am on my starvation where I'm drinking some apple juice because it's on my list of approved things. Let me get a sip. Ah, uh, Honeycrisp apple juice, organic. That otherwise, and now I'm having some Jello and some broth. That way, I can have the clean out chemicals put into me. So yeah, yeah. You know, those of you that know, you you know what's about to happen to me tomorrow. But I figured while I'm still in a good mood and I don't feel like I'm starving, let's record a show because I've been gathering so much stuff that I want to share it all with you. And uh, so here I am, uh, and it turns out the uh, we, we the antibiotics that we uh, were giving our cat. Has not made her better. Uh, so we took her back in. They says, well, the ultrasound, you know, and uh, the, my wife is kind of upset because the first vet, well, the first person we, we at the vet office didn't say anything about a potential of having like stones in the, in the cat's bladder. Well, this other this same place, this other vet says, you know, I think there's a stone right here. So he didn't give us any antibiotics or different antibiotics because the antibiotics clearly apparently did not work. Uh, so he thinks it's like there might be a stone. So we've bought. After we even just bought a bag of cat food, we bought a different bag of cat food for this cat uh, of, of our three that's supposed to help dissolve a, a stone if there is one. Uh, but to really confirm it, they need to get the cat to uh, to urinate for them, which she has not been able to do. Uh, sometimes she does, but you know, but she went right before uh, we went. But she keeps constantly trying and trying and even trying in places that she's not supposed to. I hope while I'm home today, she's not going anywhere she ain't supposed to. Uh, she, but she just has the urge to try, and it could just be simply that she's got this stone in there uh, that's making her very uncomfortable. Uh, we're hoping uh, the food's going to work and it's going to get out, but they cannot confirm it's the stone without a two hundred dollar X ray, which we don't have any savings left to take care of that. So it's becoming a very, very, very messy situation. Which is also, hey, you know, uh, speaking of money, thanks those of you who uh, would love to support us on Patreon or other sources or, or buy some of the merch, this would be a really good time for your support. Uh, we really appreciate it because, you know, it's if you own a pet, you know how tough this can be uh, trying to pay for these things. And every time you start saving some money up, you know, that's when boof, something happens in life and uh, it's all gone. So 
that's kind of where we've been at. And uh, I got to go pro- procedure tomorrow. That uh, I'm not worried about the procedure. It's today, the, the starvation day that I'm going to concern about. But we're going to have some fun today. I, I figured it's a great way to kick off this day here this morning. I was trying to be, be able to see if Philip could come on with me. Uh, I have not heard back from him because I do have a topic that I think would be good for him. But I might save it for when he gets to come back on the show because I got enough news and things to talk about with you all that I don't know that I need to. Uh, uh, to have any other topics other than we'll talk about some Michael Gumbo and some little bit of Harry Potter memories here later. So let's get on with it. Spanning the Disney and Geek Universe to bring you the best in comics, toys, movies, and entertainment. This is news from around Neverland. Well, so what was once called the greatest show on Earth, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, it's they've been on a six year break and making a lot of serious changes. And uh, now they're back and they are. They've got a brand new show. They're going around on the regular tour. Uh, uh, this I'm actually getting from a local news station, uh, KSHB.com, local here in Kansas City. And uh, they actually are on their way uh, into Kansas City here, I think, November. Somebody was talking about it, but I don't think it's in the article. But uh, there was some discussion on it on the Facebook post where uh, this this channel had posted to Facebook about this. Uh, but... What what they've said here in description of uh, Feld Entertainment producer Juliet Field Grossman or Feld Grossman. I think it's Feld because there's an OI, but said it's about celebrating these performers. We have 75 performers from 18 different nationalities doing just remarkable feats, pushing the limits of human potential. That means cannonball acts, gymnasts, bicycle daredevils and more. And it's set in a 360 degrees. Everything has to be out on the floor and we have almost no backstage. So the entire environment was inspired by the idea of a playground or a toy box spilled out on the floor. But here's the thing. No clowns at all. But some of you might be like, oh, hey, you know, cool. Because you're terrified of clowns, right? So no clowns, no animals. This is basically, you know, caving into people that uh, were, you know, thought that maybe the animals were being mistreated in a circus. And, you know, and in some cases, in some of the smaller circus, there was maybe some mistreatment. I don't know if they really ever had any mistreatment, but there's just too many people who uh, say, oh, the animal shouldn't be, you know. They'll, they'll, they'll be concerned about your training an animal to do tricks and perform, but yet these are the same people. They'll train their dog, right, to do certain behaviors, won't they, for treats? So how is that different? I'll just leave that there. I mean, I just, okay, but so there's no animals, no clowns. So basically, uh, of the three things that, you're, that the circus would be known for, you're only going to get uh, the, the regular normal human performers, which is, you know, still entertaining. Um, I mean, this is basically like Cirque du Soleil or whatever, I guess, what they've done now for years. But uh, the Ringling Brothers Circus has always been like the, what we would expect of a circus where you'd have animal acts and and uh, clowns coming out and doing, you know, goofy little things, even though some people are, ter- you know. So basically, for all of you who are terrified of clowns and all of you who are afraid that the animals were being abused, which, you know, they, they would take care of the animals. And maybe it's not, you know... So- I'm, I don't want to get into it, you know, because there's those same people who pulled out out of the circus hate zoos as well, which this is how we educate. This is how we learn so much about a lot of these animals and get to see them in a real environment. And zoos do so much to take care of animals. And a lot of these animals in captivity do better than they do out in the wild. But they do also work to keep the animals in the wild. But, you know, back in the day, this was, you know, you maybe couldn't get to a zoo, but the circus would come to you and you'd get to see these animals and you would love the animals. And then you could go and learn more about the animals. I mean, this was, you know, kind of an important function of our society for a long time for the protection of the animals. But I don't want to get off into a tangent so much on that. I just wanted to share that. Oh, look, they're back and it's going to be all different. <laughs> oh, OK. I'm going to skip this next thing. and I'm going to save it for later because it's an obituary for Michael Gambone. We're going to talk about that later. Here's something, though. Uh, if you're piggybacking on someone else's Disney Plus account, you might have to start paying up to access the streamer. And if you're the one sharing, they might actually just uh, cut you off. So uh, this is actually from Variety. It says the Mouse House is, has notified Disney Plus subscribers in Canada that as of November 1st, unless otherwise permitted by your service tier, you may not share your subscription outside of your household. Now, people have been expressing some concerns like, well, what if you go to a hotel and you want to log into your Disney Plus account? Is that going to be a problem? Because I, you know, I for a while there during COVID, I was 
taking portraits at schools, you know, the school portraits working for a company. And I'd get to a hotel room where I was, you know, I, I got to travel all around the state and I could go through and I could log into, say, Disney Plus or one of my other streaming services. and I could watch something there. And you actually as you would leave or even when you're checking out, they would wipe everything out of that system. But you could have access to your stuff while you're there. Um, but I guess that's going to be out now. Unless you have, you know, probably paying an additional fee to share. And we've already had the price going up. Uh, in fact, uh, well, I don't really so much mind this, but it's still a price increase. But I was paying $20 for the, um, like a triple package. I was getting Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. But I never watched the ESPN Plus. But now the price has gone up. and for, I went down to a $20 thing, so I'm still paying the same amount. But now I'm only getting two channels, which I guess is okay because I was only ever watching Hulu and Disney Plus anyway. So, but yeah, they just raised your prices on it because people are bailing out of Disney Plus and uh, I don't know. I don't know if I might do it. I mean, there's some stuff on there. I'd still, you know, I have not watched Ahsoka. Uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of mixed reviews. I do have a guy though at work that says I, uh, that I should go ahead and check it out. But I have, of course, seeing, and he understands this, you know, seeing once again, somebody getting a lightsaber through the gut, but I'm fine. You know, uh, I like it when lightsabers mean something, and that, that usually says that they did not put the thought in, you know, Disney's kind of wrecking Marvel and Star Wars right now, and I'm not even that, I mean, maybe I should go ahead and watch Loki, but I'm like, well, you know, what if Loki's going to go bad now, too? Because uh, I did, and I enjoyed the first season, but I was like, it's tenuous. So I was like, you know what, I was, I was kind of excited for Loki season two, but now I'm like, I'm not really excited for it anymore. And I'm not, I lost my excitement I had for going to Ahsoka. The main, main things I'm watching now on Disney Plus is the old vintage stuff, what little bit they have, which is what I wanted to get the channel for in the first place, to watch some of the old classic Mickey cartoons and the old movies and th stuff like that, which it, they have some. Uh, but it's, I said they have a lot of the Disney afternoon shows and they have a lot of those old classic stuff, which is still there, which is kind of why I, I keep my account for the old stuff that I'd still want to watch. And I was watching even a YouTube channel that says like the problem that, that Disney Plus has is they need to have new content. And so they're rushing new content to try to get as much new stuff on there as possible that they're not making always the quality we would expect. I said, you know, you kind of have a fair point. They are trying to put as much new content on there. But honestly, Disney, some new content is great, you know, but if you rely on your old, you've got a hundred year old company. And you don't think you got enough classic content that people will be like, oh, this is really great. Put every one of Walt Disney's old uh, shows, you know, the Sunday night shows or Saturday, you know, when he was your host, Walt Disney. Put all that on there. Oh, believe me, we'd watch it. You know, us Disney fans. Oh, yeah. So there's plenty of things they can do on there. But yeah, I digress. I don't like going and talking about Disney on the show because we're no longer a Disney show. <laughs> uh, so insiders say PlayStation's live service pivot may not be going well. Uh, now, let me just read some of this for you. It says, in the wake of the Jim Ryan era of PlayStation, while he leaves behind a successful PS5 and a string of expectedly good first party releases, attention now turns to Sony's stated super investment in live service games. Previously, they revealed it would be 60% of the of spending as opposed to 40% going into their trademark single player games. And they have at least a dozen titles in the works. Bloomberg's Jason Scryer is reporting that insiders are concerned about the company's vision going forward, where things are spread out between seemingly misplaced bets on service games, along with PSVR 2 and PlayStation Portal, both relative niche pieces of hardware. So is it possible that, I mean, granted, you know, I, I do have the online account, so I, 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 but I don't really play a lot with other people. Uh, I mainly have the whole account so I can access some of the older games and also a lot of other games that it saves me money. I don't have to buy every game, but I'm like, you know, there's a game that I'm thinking I might want to play this, but I'm not sure. But, oh, I can play it for free because of my service. You know, it, it comes in handy, but I still have a backlog of games to play that I do own. Uh, in fact, we're coming up very soon. Uh, we'll have the Spider-Man 2 game, which is going to be fun. Until then, I am still playing. I, I didn't get into, you know, what I've been watching, what I've been playing, but I have been playing that Sea of Stars and rather enjoying myself. And it was free for a little while, but now you're going to have to pay for it at $34.99, which is a pretty fair price for it. It's actually had a lot of depth and detail in that game. Um, and I've been looking at the a streamer package thing to where I can do a full review of it maybe uh, later when I finish the game with a few uh, sound effects and stuff that they provide. So it's kind of cool. Um, but, you know, the, the PSVR and, and I watch like an official UK PlayStation uh, channel on YouTube, PlayStation Access, and they'll go through and have all the new stuff like the, the PSVR and all the stuff. It's like how many of us have went out and bought the PSVR? So, uh, you know, if Sony puts a lot of uh, focus on to these type of things and I mean, the average person isn't going to play the VR stuff. 
then yeah, you're going to lose money. So there are some people actually having some concerns about uh, what Sony is up to. So it's a very long article, and I'm not going to get into it. But uh, you know, I, I kind of wonder if they're going to have to change some direction on some of these ideas. All righty, well, it's time to go to the trailer park. Mama, now the gator got in the house. Now the gator, give me that sugar. Come here. Oh, oh, get him, mama. Oh, get that gator. Oh, ah, oh, ah. The Neverland Trailer Park. Okay, uh, we're going to have some things to say about this. You know, we're going to actually cover another Disney item. Wish has a new trailer. Asha! I'm here! I'm here! Whew, just uh, one second. Let me catch my breath. <laughs> Once upon a time stood Rosas, the most magical kingdom, founded by a king with the power to grant wishes. You are their handsomest, most beloved king. You're right. I am a handsome king. I'm so nervous, I think I'm going to explode. My best friend, the king's apprentice. Is my mouth drooping? I feel like it's drooping. Asha, come with me. The wishes of Rosas. Whoa. People give their wishes to me, and I grant the wishes I am sure are good for Rosas. Some of these will never be granted. Not some. Most. They deserve more than... I decide what everyone deserves. So I look up at the stars to guide me. I wish. And throw caution to every warning sign. Oh, you spoil us with your magic. I didn't do it. What? Last night, I made a wish on a star. Uh, <laughs> and the star answered. I'm talking. I am talking. Ha! Who knew my voice would be this low? I believe I have just been threatened. Who would dare threaten you? I have no response to that. So <laughs> there is a traitor amongst us. Find Asha. Asha it's a dead end. With unsanded mahogany. <laughs> oh, good find, Valentino. My butt found it. I started this. I have to finish it. So I make this wish. What are you hiding? Oh, nothing. To be lived. And nobody. What is going on in there? Okay, ladies. Your wings can't fly, but your voices can. <laughs> Okay, so this is slated to come out Thanksgiving. Right now, I'm on the official Walt Disney Animation Studios um, uh, YouTube channel. And right now, there are 2,000 more dislikes on this. Because, yes, you can look at the dislikes on YouTube with the right uh, add-on to your Google Chrome. 2,000 more dislikes than there are likes at this moment. People are disliking this. And uh, yeah, and, and there's some people that are kind of sitting in the middle and they're, they're kind of sitting on why there's a lot of dislikes. Let me look. I mean, even uh, here's a, a comment from seven days ago and uh, they're saying, I actually don't think the king is wrong and now granting every wish. Curious to see where Disney takes this. There's people trying to give Disney the benefit of the doubt. And even someone else, you know, even though the king seems like the villain, I think he's probably right that granting everyone's wishes would be a bad thing. And someone else saying, I hope she learns that everyone getting everything they want all the time isn't what's best for anyone. And uh, yeah, Disney achieves the impossible, makes the protagonist, the antagonist of, and the villain, the most likely the hero of the story. And other people, I'm with the king. People wish for stupid things and they should figure out how to do things for themselves. Curious how this one will lose. So, yeah, uh, well, oh, look, here we go. There's one person I'm incredibly excited to see this film. There's one. Here's another one. Who else is rooting for the king? It would be a crazy twist that I'm all for. People shouldn't get everything they want. That would be a horrible message, especially for kids. Yeah, so this king has the power to grant wishes, uses it to control his kingdom and give it peace. But since he's only granting the wishes that won't cause problems, he's the bad guy. But his daughter awakens with the same ability and now she only threatens him, but wants to use her powers to grant every wish, even though that might not be good. Well, that person, I don't think, caught on that this is not uh, his daughter. This is she comes along to be the apprentice. But this is kind of a lesson we saw. And we're, we're trying to learn aspects of God here, right? 
So Bruce Almighty, we learned there's reasons why you never doesn't get everything they want. And God has to say no and say no a lot. But anything we ask in his name and his will, you know, we have to we, we need to kind of get in tune for God and, you know, and always ask for things. But don't ask for just your just wants, but just ask for things that are, are, are just good. And sometimes you don't always get I mean, heck, uh, Paul, the apostle, uh, asked for a thorn to be removed from his side, you know, whatever it was and never got it removed. Sometimes God leaves you with stuff that's rough and tough on you, but you, we don't always see the end game. You don't always get everything you want, but you don't see the big, the end game. Now, so Bruce Almighty kind of tried to teach us that move that with that movie, right? Now here is Disney poking the eye at God, where if, if basically this king's supposed to be representative of God, it's like, oh, he's this benevolent and everything's wonderful in this kingdom, and we all we bring our wishes to him, and he collects them. He collects them. But he loves to have them for some reason. That's that's also the prayers of the saints. God collects those. And when you look in Revelation, like, oh, the prayers, he loves them. He can't always give us exactly what we want because he's, you know, he sees more than we do. And so we don't, and sometimes we get what we want, but we got to wait for it. You know, it's, it's different from God's perspective and ours, right? But this movie is comparing this king to God and saying, oh, he's evil for not giving us everything we want. So now our, our, our protagonist is going to get this wishing star because, oh, because when you wish upon a star, and that was one of the things, it was, you know, dreams and stuff that Walt kind of went with and it would like to have fairy tales around. But now we're going, oh, well, now she can grant everybody's wish. But it's going to make the, the king the bad guy. So I, this movie is going to tank. People who are taking the time to even watch this, that maybe still have hope that's, that Disney will put a movie out there that you want to see. And I haven't bothered seeing uh, the Disney animated features since, um, uh, okay, the dragon one. I did see that one. And I, I kind of liked it. I didn't like Aquafina so much. She was kind of annoying. But that's the last time I, I think I went to a theater to see a Disney film. They're losing out on, on a lot of people. And this people looking at this and say, what is, what is the message here? But people don't like that message. And so there's people going to give it the benefit of the and going to try to say, well, maybe the message is going to be that the king was right. And they're hoping for that. But I don't trust Disney to do that. Now, if it turns out when it comes out, and it'd be a big spoiler warning, if they, oh, yeah, it turns out, you know, hey, she learns the king was right, then everything's cool, then all right, you know, then maybe maybe they actually would have a decent message in this movie. But I don't know that this is going to go that way. But this, they're uh, <laughs> they're getting a lot of dislikes on this. All right, here's another one. I wasn't planning to cover, but I found it. Color Purple is official trailer too. Ain't you got something to make you just smile? My sister, and I ain't seen her in years. You know, if you ain't gonna laugh, you need to sell your footy bone. <laughs> oh! I was married to a man I didn't love. Whatever I say. He took my sister away from me. Even if we have to part, you and me, us, us have, have one heart. How come you so nice? I don't know. Maybe you too nice. You seem like trouble. I come here out of respect. But if there ain't nothing to get, that show ain't nothing to get. Some changes made. You got to stand up. I know my sister somewhere in the world. Someday we're gonna meet again. Keep your head held high, just like Mom taught us. It's time I be free from you and then turn to creation. I'd die before I let that happen. Good. That's just a going away present I've been needing. Oh! Sweet 
and loving God. Okay, this is coming out on Christmas Day. Uh, I had seen the, uh, the previous trailer on there, and I was kind of kind of curious. Uh, so, the um, the original movie came out what in the I want to say late eighties, early nineties, probably late eighties. Uh, it was an Oscar winning film. I never saw it because I, I was really not into a drama and it looked anytime I saw it, it seemed like just depressing drama. Um, and I remember, though, in marching band, we did play the theme song. I mean, the, the movie won a lot of awards back when it came out. So this is this is a, a more a, I don't know if we're more of a reimagining more than a remake, because it looks like they've, they've presented it as a musical because a lot of their cast are people who are known for being able to sing. And you got Quincy Jones as one of the producers, along with Oprah Winfrey and Steven Spielberg, um, which she was, I guess it's a book as well. But Oprah Winfrey was one of the stars in it. I think Spielberg might have directed the original one, if I remember correctly. So you know, I am kind of curious because as a musical, this might, you know, this it feels more like it's a feel good. Although it's going to deal with, you know, a serious, maybe be kind of dramatic. It's, there's just something about this that's kind of a feel good. Um, uh, although that, well, this trailer, there's almost as many dislikes as likes right now, but I don't know something about this. I kind of want to check it out. Uh, you know, when I even saw the first trailer, I, you know, and I was like this kind of, when I was looking at it and before the title had come up, I said, this reminds me of that color purple movie from a long time ago. And then it turned out that's what it was like a remake on it. And I was like, you know, I never saw the original. So I would, I could go into this with a fresh state of mind of, you know, this, you know, of not knowing what the story is. So, uh. You know, I'm kind of curious. I might want to check it out. I don't know. It's, you know, I, I can enjoy a good musical. Here's something that uh, I have both an article and a, uh, I, you know, I haven't even watched this teaser. But uh, let's play this teaser. I don't know if there's any um, actual dialogue in here. I have not watched it. Let's listen. ¿Crees que volviste para vengar la muerte de yeah, it's in Spanish. No. No he sido yo quien lo ha elegido. Which makes sense for this. Han sido los espíritus. Ellos te han elegido para que seas el nuevo defensor de estas tierras. Okay, so that little quick 21 second teaser. Did you hear what they said at the end? Zorro. Yes, a Zorro. Uh, I don't know if this is a series or a movie. Let's see here. It says Meta One Rights has unveiled the first teaser of the anticipated Zorro series reboot, which is directed by Javier Quintas, who did Money Heist and Sky Rojo. And it's set to premiere on opening night of MIPCOM. Produced by leading Spanish company Sequoia Studios, the show marks the IP's big television comeback almost two decades after its last live-action adaptation. The Spanish-language series will have its premiere screening at MIPCON on October 15th. Prime Video has already bought Zorro for the U.S., Latin America, Spain, Andorra, and Portugal. But anyone writes is repping other territories. So we don't have a confirmed... Oh, no, we can do it. Yeah, all right. So Prime Video has got it for the U.S. Yes, all right. So... This is, of course, set in 1834 Los Angeles. Zorro stars Miguel Bernardo from Elite in a, the, the, this is one of those $5 words, eponymous role, playing a new version of Diego de la Vega. Bernardo stars opposite Renata Notney, a rising young Mexican talent as Lolita Marquez. The cast is completed by Dalia, I can't pronounce that, Paco Tuas. Uh, we might have to get uh, Mary Howell from uh, Nerds and Jesus on here to help us with this when this comes on. Uh, she, you know, because <laughs> she could probably watch this without reading the subtitles that I'm going to be watching. But this is going to be a 10 part show. This according all to Variety. I am curious because like hey, it's, a, it's a new take on Zorro uh, and actually doing in the language that it would have been spoken had this, you know, been an actual story. So, yeah, I'm curious. I want to check it out. All right. Moving on to the next trailer I have here. I had to cut down a little bit. There we go. After death is what this is called. It was 1969, a beautiful day to fly. We were about 100 feet above the ground when I started noticing that something was wrong. It was engine failure. Trees were filling our windshield. I found myself above the crash site. And while I'm processing what I'm looking at, I can see a pilot, and this is me. No two near-death experiences are the same. Out of nowhere, a trainer truck kept me head on. But they typically occur in a very consistent process. We began to go down the river. 
and my boat became pinned. I was drowning. The first thing that happens is called an out-of-body experience. And they come to a place of exquisite beauty. They very commonly see a light. Deceased relatives come to meet them. The first person I saw was my grandfather. Now I'm traveling like a rocket ship, straight upwards. And with that, <sighs> oh my God, I'm alive. But not every near-death experience is a good one. 23% had hellish experiences. I saw a black tunnel. I mean, just falling. I wasn't in fear, I was in terror. It was just darkness. Put me back. I don't belong here. I heard a voice before I woke up. You still have a purpose on Earth. I was very skeptical. I never felt alive and then dead. I felt alive and then more alive. I had full brain recordings from the dying human brain. Even though they were unconscious, they were able to give corroborative evidence. She's describing stuff that she just shouldn't know. The same right. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? This really does show that there is life after death. Okay, so October 22nd, or 27th, I mean, from Angel Studios, the Aura Films. Uh, they are doing it as a pay it forward. You can get your tickets, or you can even buy tickets for somebody else to come along, same way they did with Sound of Freedom. After Death is a gripping feature film that explores what happens after we die based on real near-death experiences conveyed by scientists, authors, and survivors from the New York Times best-selling authors who brought you titles like 90 Minutes in Heaven, Imagine Heaven, To Heaven and Back, and we're just a cinematic peek beyond the veil that exp examines the spiritual and scientific dimensions of mortality, inviting us to wonder, is there life after death? So this is, yes, a documentary. And I am interested to check this out. Now, of course, those of you that have been with us for a long time know that I do know and believe there is life after death, just where you're going to spend it. And that all depends upon what you do with Jesus, right? That's where it all kind of stems from is what do you do with Jesus? Do you believe who he said he was? And people say, well, he never said he was, he was the son of God or God, but he did. He did to say, and he did say that and he came because we all have a problem of sin. We've all done wrong things. Jesus came to pay that price for us on the cross and died and was resurrected to prove who he was. And giving us now a chance to be resurrected with him and to be with him. And you can accept his free gift of salvation. You can believe on him and then repent from your sins and follow after him. Or you can choose to reject him. And that's, that's there's your decision. And I'm sure it's going to be a theme of this movie considering the source of who made the film. But yeah, if you would like to discuss that further, please send me an email. Go ahead or find me on Facebook. Uh, easier to send me an email podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. But yeah, so I'm kind of excited about checking that out. Let's see, what else have we got here? Here's something I didn't even know that this guy existed, but uh, there's there was somebody else who was similar to Mr. Rogers called Mr. Dress Up. I believe in Canada. Let's listen. Oh, here you are. You're here and we're here. I've got a good bat costume here to show you. Didn't matter what race you were, what color you were, what religion you were, what language you spoke, you watched Mr. Dress Up. Ernie Coombs, Mr. Dress Up. I mean, he was just so kind and gentle. Ernie never forgot a child within him, and that informs everything that he does with children. When you tell people that Fred Rogers and Ernie Coombs came to Canada together, most people don't even realize that they were very close friends. 4,000 episodes, 30 years. There are not that many shows that last that long. Tell us what the secret is to 30 years on the air. I'm a, a child at heart. It's all doing things that I always liked to do when I was a kid. The tickle trunk was this magical, like, Pandora's box. As soon as you open that lid, something was going to happen, something magical. I'm Tugboat Captain Dressup. Is he going to be a wizard? Oh, no, he's a dinosaur. The endless possibility of that. Oh, my, what a lovely day. Judith was able to make Casey come completely alive. I didn't know if Casey was a boy or a girl. Way ahead of its time, not a little bit, a way ahead of its time. Looking back on it now, I wonder, how on earth did I manage to do it for so long? And then how on earth have I managed to survive so long after I finished? 
Having been Mr. Dress Up for 20 years has probably made me a better person. You assume that he comes home and kicks off his Mr. Dress Up shoes and becomes a different person when he's at home, and <laughs> that just simply didn't happen. The kids tease me a lot because I laugh at his jokes. That's why I married you, because you're such a great audience. I'm a good audience. <laughs> Of course, when Sesame Street came on, they said, oh, that'll be the end of you. There was a question whether the show would go on. We were having a rap party. But then as time went on, I think we were getting the sense that Ernie was getting concerned. How could he possibly continue what he wants to? You have made me what I am today. You know that. Hi, Mr. Dessa. Hi. One of the reasons I became an actor was because very early age, this person on television, an adult but not an adult, taught me that it was OK to let my free flag fly. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great Canadians. Let's do that. So, October 10th, today, this is on Prime. Uh, so that would be Amazon, of course. Uh, Mr. Dressup, I had never heard of him. I, this was a Canadian show that I don't know that it ever crossed over, at least to where I'm at here in Kansas City. Uh, they didn't show it on public television or anything. But it was bringing the world of imagination and dress up and, you know, dressing up in different kind of characters and stuff. And, uh, you know, remind me a lot of Mr. Rogers, which, of course, you heard Fred Rogers in there. You know, they were friends. Uh, so I am kind of interested in checking that out. And yeah, I know we've got a, yet another documentary. Uh, here's something else that happened, and you know, people are uh, getting mixed ideas on this, but we got a, a first look at Masters of Universe Revolution. Now, a lot of this is going to be some action, but there's a little dialogue, but uh, this is coming pretty soon to Netflix, and uh, here's He-Man battling Scareclos, Scareglow with his father, King Randor, looking on. I thought it was a great scene. This bully bothering you, son? <laughs> well done, Adam. That's my boy. Thieves! You suckers! You will all! Become part of my collection. Go get him, son. So Master Universe Revolution is coming in 2024. Right now on Netflix's channel, this is sitting at 6.7 thousand likes and 13 thousand dislikes. And I don't understand what people are, 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 are hating about this. I just don't understand. Uh, but there's people I know who did not like Revelation. They... You know, this was a Masters of the Universe series. They didn't put He-Man's name in the title, but He-Man was in every episode of Revelation, and I don't understand. And, and this was a series that explored why was Adam worthy to be He-Man? What was it that made Adam special to be chosen to be He-Man, the Defender of Grayskull? That first, the first two seasons, it kind of explored that. And I enjoyed it. Am I weird that I enjoy that? I'm a huge you know, He-Man fan. I've got toys on the wall over on the top of two um, dressers. You know, we've discussed this before. I'm a fan of this kind of thing. And I enjoyed the 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 series. And a lot of people didn't. But I, I was like, I feel like they're wanting to find something to hate about it. And they're just they're just going to decide choose to hate it just because I, and I just I don't understand. I don't understand. But I enjoyed this. I'm excited after seeing this. And, but there's comments like, and that's all the He-Man you're going to get this season. Uh, and I, it's like, I, you, don't, you don't know. How, do, how are you going to make that assumption? You don't know, but you think it's going to be a Tila series because we, like the first, first season of, uh, or first half of that, that previous one, we had a lot of Tila. But Tila was a major character 
in the original show. And it was always in every episode, there was either flashback or either He-Man was in that directly or there was a flashback to it. He-Man was always involved or somehow or another related to what was going on in that first bit of it. And then we were trying to get at restore Adam to the, the power and take it, you know, get it from Skeletor. But we got to explore some of the other characters of Masters of the Universe, which is a lot of different characters. He-Man is but one. He's just our, our, our primary. But, you know, I don't know. I never understood the hate people gave this because it was a good show. I was very entertained by it. And I am excited to see where this one goes, uh, see what happens on this one. I will be definitely checking this out. OK, I got to find my next trailer. Here we go. Uh so here's a quick little look at uh, a Scott Pilgrim animated series that's coming to Netflix. This is a, a clip. So, do you know this one girl with hair like this? Ramona Flowers. Ramona. She's from New York City. The Big Apple. She moved here after a bad breakup. She's single? Got a job delivering DVDs for Netflix. DVDs for Netflix. I'm like her only friend in town. She needs friends. I forbid you from dating her, Scott Pilgrim! Cool, thanks, Julie. Bye. Wallace, quick! What movie should I rent? You're banned from no account video. You owe, like, a good jillion dollars in late fees? Not the rental place. I'm using the World Wide Web. What should I rent? Hmm. Something starring a hot guy. I think I need the name of a hot guy. Hmm, fine. Um, Lucas Lee. Best chest in the business. Hmm, action doctor. Let's hope there's a heaven. Thrilled to be here. Ooh, the game is over too. It's over a second time. That sounds fun. But are you waiting for the DVD? It's going to take a bit. How long could it take? Scott Pilgrim takes off coming uh, November 17th of all things. Uh, so this is a, a, a parent clearly set it in like the nineties and Netflix or like the early two thousands or something. I don't know where, well, cause it wouldn't have been the nineties and late nineties. was Netflix a thing. Oh, it's been a while, hasn't it? But like the early two thousands, you know, Netflix was a DVD service. You rented stuff and Ramona flowers. I guess the person who delivered DVDs, didn't they just come in the mail? So this seems kind of weird, uh, but that was a short little clip there. It's kind of fun of seeing him go and try to rent a movie. And then he sits there at the door waiting for Ramona to deliver the DVD. So it's an animated series coming to Netflix very soon. Scott Pilgrim takes off. They went with the art style that I, uh, I figure the comic was originally, there was a comic of this and I figure it's that style. And it's even the style. There was a, a Scott Pilgrim versus the world game, which I own a copy. I have not sat down and played the whole thing. That's on my list of things I need to do. Uh, but it's kind of that goofy kind of fun style. This clearly was animated on computer. And the, they even took the time where the conversation he's having with Julie there, whoever's in the foreground is slightly blurred. So you'll focus more on the, the person who's talking to you, but the, you know, then they switch angles and stuff like that. Uh, so that to me, that says computer animated uh, in style. But uh, this could be fun if you were uh, and I watched the movie once and I did think it was kind of fun and a neat style. So I'm kind of curious where they're going to do with this series. So I'm going to probably check it out. Uh, there's no dialogue to this. I don't know if I'm going to bother clicking on this, but uh, there is a Tomb Raider animated series also coming. Uh, it is called Tomb Raider, The Legend of Laura Croft. This is coming to Netflix. They had a first look you can find on Netflix's YouTube channel. Uh, there's really no dialogue or anything. So, I mean, it's just a lot of sounds and you're watching an animated Laura Croft. So. Uh, for those of you that are fans, check it out. Here's something that I don't know how much coverage is going to be. It's February 2nd is when this is coming out, but uh, the makers of this tend to have made these like, R-rated films. So this may be the only time we're ever going to mention this, but it looked like it might be kind of fun. I don't know if it's set in the world of the King's Men or not. It's just the same people who brought you that. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a listen to Argyle. I certainly hope you dance as well as you dress. There's only one way to find out. Put on your shoes and dance the blues. You and I, we're not so different. Agent Argyle. Little help? Hold on. The book 
is phenomenal, sweetie, but... What happens next? It's called a cliffhanger, mother. Ellie, it's called a cop-out. Whoa, hey, there's a cat in there. Freaking Conway. Author of the Argyle series, Ellie Conway. I am such a fan. Oh yeah, what is it you do? Espionage. Would you sign my book? Here we go. I love this book. Come on. people real life spies why would they care about me because you're when you wrote your new book actually happened and you kicked a hornet's nest you didn't even know existed i'm in some really big trouble mom oh so now you're experimenting with drugs i want all assets on them now i need her to write the next chapter So this is coming in February from Universal Pictures. The description here says, don't let the cat out of the bag. Argyle movie in theaters, February 2nd. The greater the spy, the bigger the line. From the twisted mind of Matthew Vaughn from Kingsman franchise and kick butt comes Argyle, a razor-witted, reality-bending, globe-encircling spy thriller. So this has Bryce Dallas Howard as Ellie Conway, a reclusive author of a series of best-selling espionage novels who, I, whose idea of bliss is a night at home with her computer and her cat, Alfie. But when the plots of Ellie's fictional books, which center around secret agent Argyle and its mission to unravel a global spy syndicate, begin to mirror the covert actions of a real-life spy organization, quiet evenings at home become a thing of the past. And we've got Sam Rockwell as Aiden, who's a cat allergic spy. Uh, and they're racing around the world. But, uh, you know, we've got Henry Cavill, John Cena, uh, Ariana DeBose uh, from West Side Story. I, don't, I didn't recognize her. Um, Brian Cranston popping up, Catherine O'Hara. I mean, a lot of t- different people in here. But the concern I have in here, and I've already had to, I'm going to do some editing here. Hopefully I got everything of uh, a little bit of taking the Lord's name in vain. Um, I'm going to try to take out of here. But uh, the movies mentioned Kingsman and Kick Butt are, are all R-rated films. And I haven't seen them. I don't go to R-rated films so much anymore. I've, I've, as I've gotten older, I, I just don't go to those. Uh, and uh, this is also not the type of stuff I share necessarily on this show. I mean, I might go to the first show because this looked like it might be kind of fun. But uh, as, as I find out what the rating of this film is, uh, we'll probably abandon talking about this movie, even though it, it potentially could be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I'm, you know, if it's a, an amount of uh, extreme violence and amounts of language or nudity on there, it's going to make me back out. Uh, that's why I didn't see Oppenheimer because I found out the uh, large amounts of nudity going on. And that's also why we're not going to talk about the Toxic Avenger because, uh, it was, I think of an R rated film back before another R rated film coming over that. And there might be some people excited in this community, but that's not what we do here. Sorry. That's just not going to work for us. But now let's get into some other, um, Bits of fun. Michael Gambone, veteran actor, played Dumbledore in the Harry Potter series, passed away at age 82. Uh, He was Irish born. He got knighted for his illustrious career on stage and screen. This is all from the AP, uh, AP APnews.com, to be specific. Um, He passed away. uh, Well, they're saying Wednesday, uh, but this has been this was last week. Uh, Yeah, the September 28th. But yeah, he passed away from uh, having a bout of pneumonia. Uh, then the, um, uh, well, I got, I can't see who it was from his family, but yeah, I guess it just, just overall the family saying this in a statement says that they're devastated to announce the loss of Sir Michael Gambone, beloved husband and father. Michael died peacefully in a hospital with his wife Anne and son Fergus at his bedside. So we're just getting a general statement from the family on there. Uh, he was in a lot of films, including Gosford Park, uh, Paddington, uh, I've pulled up even a list of all his different films. Uh, there an article from the times that I even found. Um, and uh, I mean, I did find that he did a, a Muppet television thing, which is like a sort of a um, anthology series. Jim Henson was doing, and he appeared in one of those. Uh, but most of what he did, he did a lot of stuff in, uh, in, in Britain. And so I, when I was looking through a list of all the different things he had done, now a lot of it is stuff I had not ever heard of. Um, but I do recall one time 
seeing, and I don't know if it's going far enough back. Wow, we're going back to the 60s and some of this stuff, but I swear I saw, and I cannot think of the name of the movie. I think it's the one where he loses his memory. It's, um, oh man, where is it? Where is it? Well, there is Toys with Robin Williams, but he, I, Clean Slate, there it is. He was in Clean Slate with Dana Carvey, where Dana Carvey is a private detective who loses his memory and he has to record all the stuff on a tape and then play it back for himself the next day because he, every time he goes to sleep, he forgets everything. And Michael Gambone was the villain, which I had seen it back in the in the 80s, but I would not have known Michael Gambone until later. Uh, of course, he also had a role in Sleepy Hollow. Uh, I almost forgot about that one. Uh, Gosford Park, a lot of different things that... Uh, you know, I have not seen, but of course the main thing we know him from, of course, is playing. You know, he was the second person to play Dumbledore. Um, now what's interesting about this, and I wanted to have Philip on here to kind of talk about this because I'm kind of one that got him interested in Harry Potter stuff is. So when the, the first Harry Potter film came, first came out, and some of you are going to know this, if you've been with me for a long time, of those of you who are new to the show, uh, I kind of looked at it and says, well, what is even, what is this? And I had heard some comparisons to Star Wars with it. And I was like, ooh, really? Hmm. Seems like it might have been a ripoff of Star Wars. But really, you know, Star Wars uses kind of a, a character formula that we find actually used a lot. Uh, but I went to go see the film, the first one, because I had a free ticket. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll go. Let me, let me go and look at this. I enjoyed the music. I liked the style of it. But I was actually, I started to doze off. <laughs> and I was looking and said, wow, this is Han, Luke, and Leia. And I, being someone who studied mythology in school and everything, seeing a Cerberus that was kind of used in a weird way, I thought, but at least he was guarding something. Because um, normally this was the Guardian of Hades, you know? <laughs> so I was like, was he sitting on this thing? And there was a lot of stuff. I said, well, that was kind of cute, but it really did not get me into it. And I was kind of, eh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't see what the big deal of this is. But as things went on, uh, I saw the, the trailers for the Goblet of Fire and I was like, oh, that looks like this has been getting a bit more interesting. And I was kind of curious. I was like, you know, I kind of want to watch this one. It's like, I got the dragon and stuff. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I kind of want to watch it. So I thought maybe the books are better. And so the, the first book that I listened to that I could get from a library was the third the Prisoner of Azkaban, which is the first movie that Michael Gambone played Dumbledore in. See how that relates? <laughs> but the, I found the book to be better than the movie, and I, The Prisoner of Azkaban is one of my lower tiered of the uh, films. Uh, that director, I, I didn't really care for what he, you know, everything was, I mean, granted, I guess we got Dementor, so it's aiming for depression, but the first two films are, to me, are still kind of my favorites, that one and the fourth one, because there's more color and fun going on, even despite, like, some maybe dark storylines that happened, there was a, a sense of fun, which I found to be in the books, there's a sense of fun about it, even all the way up to Denthly Hollows, there's still, we never really lose that sense of fun and excitement and adventure. Uh, I mean, there's there's a long drawn out period when they're all camping around in the Deathly Hollows. My wife really doesn't like that in the book and in the movie either. There's this long drawn out period there that's kind of sad. But there's there's still we we pick up that sense of adventure again. It doesn't take too long, but you, I, I think you know you're you're trying to build up story to have Ron slowly being giving in to the uh, the Horcrux. You know, uh, it's kind of necessary so you get where that that happens and that comes from a little extra drama and stuff. Uh, but I you know I. I really enjoyed Richard Harris as Dumbledore. I mean, he's a great actor in heck, even in Gladiator. I mean, he was just a great actor. And so Gal Michael Gambone was a pretty good choice for a replacement. But uh, if I'm recalling, and I probably should have watched this again, but when they talk about that, when they were developing Michael Gambone's take on Dumbledore, they didn't want it to be identical to Richard Harris because they, 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 you, they figured that you could not really top Richard Harris. So I said, okay, we'll just do something slightly different. So it took a while to come on of what sort of accent he was going to have and even doing a different hat, a different wardrobe because they were like, okay, well, Richard Harris really established something and we don't want to step on it. So let's just present a new Dumbledore and be different. And they really did. And uh, I, Michael Gambone, I did like him as Dumbledore. I mean, he was interesting. Uh, but he didn't have that twinkle in his eye as much as Richard Harris did that, that Dumbledore is always described as having. Uh, but, you know, I still enjoyed him through all the other films. And uh, that's the main stuff I'm always going to know him for. He did pop up in an episode of Doctor Who. Uh, I believe he's almost kind of a Scrooge like character, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while since I've seen that episode It's one of the Christmas episodes where he popped up. But basically, Doctor Who is a who's who of who's been in Harry Potter movies <laughs> that pops up on British actors that has shown up in Doctor Who. Everybody showed up. Uh, so <laughs> that's not surprising. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I got into the Harry Potter, you know, the books. And I've always enjoyed the books better than the films. 
But I do enjoy the films as well. Uh, but from those and getting into the books, I was, you know, Philip being my best friend, I was like, you know, actually, when you get into these, these aren't bad. But both of us had kind of a bad taste in our mouth because what what we were told was in there. Uh, and like even the first film, someone that Philip was working with, I believe, at Sam's Club was uh, going on about, see, now you understand what we go through because this person was a Wiccan or something like that. We're, you know. And they, and he says, what, you face, face 300 dogs and dragons all the time? You know, but there was there was, a, you know, a, a Harry Potter, you're going to take out what you put into it. And there were people who were into occult stuff that was trying to take stuff out of it. But really, there's no occult in the books or in the films. There is what I call the fairy tale magic, the stuff you're going to see in, in every other fairy tale. Now, if you ever go and stuff, read something or watch something and they're drawing circles and summoning spirits, stay away from that. That is true story, and that is where people you know are trying to summon when they're trying to summon the dead Ouija boards. You're gonna you're not gonna talk to the dead. You're gonna talk to demons. Uh, so stay away from that kind of thing. Drawing circles. Um, that's why I'm also kind of hesitant. Uh, even though I've, I've got a copy of it for Scare Play, which is going on right now. I'm still playing some scare games, other than uh, playing the uh, Sea of Stars. But uh, that's one thing that kind of bothers me on one of them called Demonologist, where not only do you have to identify what kind of monster you're dealing with in there, but you also have to try to banish it. But part of the banishment is drawing this circle to get it out there, which I don't like that. But then they also have you quoting scripture at it and uh, in a very exorcism style of the power of Christ compels you kind of manner. So I was like, OK, well, they strike a balance. I'll probably play. and I haven't played it yet, but I do plan on sharing that on the official Neverland gaming channel where you can find me playing uh, Phasmophobia a couple of times where you just have to identify what kind of spirits in there and everything. But really, they're all some sort of version of a demon to me. They're all horrible monsters, and they will kill you. Uh, so that's why I'm like, you know, I can I can deal with this. This is more real realistic to me. So, but yeah, if you ever see that in a in a book or, or a movie or whatever, where the drawn circles and summoning a spirit, and there was some book somebody recommended uh, some book series to me, and I can't remember the name of it, but I got to the point where they were drawn a circle to summon the main spirit, the character or whatever. I was like, no, 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 because that is for real. That is legit how stuff is done and bad things happen. Uh, I even had, you know, heck I had a guy I used to work with in one place that had gotten into that stuff and had seen a lot of stuff. And says like, whatever you do, don't ever mess with this stuff. Cause they would do stuff. Some spirits then have it do stuff and it would levitate books and all this stuff. And he says like, you know, there's stuff I should never have messed with that we were messing with even at uh, my church. We had some kids that started messing with Ouija boards and stuff like that. And had like the demonic presence that was trying to show up uh, when a uh, youth, youth functions uh stuff happens and they they did see it at one point uh when they were messing around they were camping in the backyard and messing around with stuff and summoned something they were, it basically stood out in the street and was watching them and it just stayed there but you know they all this stuff came out and they, uh, they had to confess it after we'd had like a youth lock-in and the people were in the corner were doing stuff it came out and the pastor had to sit and have a talk with us after church uh and i what was spooky about that uh, and Philip, I'm sure, has plenty more stories, and his mother could tell stories because his his father was involved in people who you know, demon possessed people and going and being called to it. You know, you you, think you hear about Catholic priests being some. It's like no, a Baptist minister can be. You know, somebody call him to go because uh, we as Christians would just need to be prepared, I guess, for this sort of thing. Um, Jesus was always, you know, getting demons out of people and sending his apostles to do it, and they were not always successful. Prayer and fasting kind of tends to be a good idea. But uh, anyway, so back to what I was talking about. But you know, after we had these kids that were doing this in my youth group, uh, and we had this thing, I remember it was warm, it was comfortable around the table where we were all that, where the pastor was going, and people were confessing this thing. But I had to, I had to get up and go to the bathroom at one point. I got up, went into the, the, the was the further I got away from the table, the colder it was, and it was like ice and freezing temperatures inside of our the bathroom as i'd gotten away from the table uh but we had to go through the thing and we had to pray uh, to get this demon out of there and was, but we had all kinds of stuff being confessed by some people of what they had been doing just messing around and they had invited this evil presence into the youth group and it was infiltrating and uh, we managed to get rid of them uh through the power of jesus christ uh I mean, and some people kind of they, they have a hard time believing these sort of things happen they believe in Christ or whatever, but they don't believe this sort of thing happens. But this is why one of the reasons I will never doubt, other than the fact that I've I've actually fractured my neck when I was little and I'm walking around and I'm not paralyzed, or I should have had uh, worse consequences to that. This is where I know God has a purpose for me to be here on this earth because I probably should have been taken out because there were too many dumb things that happened around my fracturing my neck. I've you know talked about that before too. Uh, but yeah, having this whole situation, uh, there is a spiritual dimension of things indeed. Uh, and uh, atheists just never seem to experience these things, I guess. But 
but having that experience and even like the the cold freezing temperatures when i got away from the table we were all sad at i mean just it was i didn't know what that was at the time but it's stuff i've learned later that you know as for people and talk about when you're in the presence of you know spirits that uh, and even used in the sixth sense movie uh that that's kind of a, an occurrence and i'm like oh that, that explains because i remember it being a really weird it was so cold and i had to go to the bathroom <laughs> so yeah um so stay away from that, <laughs> by the way. I feel like I've drugged this down. I was trying to talk about uh, Malcolm Gambone and uh, lots of great films that he made, and mainly, of course, the Harry Potter series. And uh, the difference between what you're going to find in Harry Potter stuff being very much fairy tale magic, very much, uh, and, and like weird Latin phrases or whatever, you know, that I didn't see any harm. But if you bring in the idea of that stuff into it, you're probably going to take that, have that as a takeaway. But really, she pulled from some mythology, some like old folklore, you know, we've got a lot of folklore even in the United States, but mainly of course in Europe, there's all kinds of folklores of different little creatures that supposed to existed and stuff like that. And, uh, I don't have a problem with fantasy or like Lord of the Rings or anything. And this is very similar in style, uh, on the type of magic. Of course, the interesting thing is Lord of the Rings. When you get into the exploration of who Gandalf really is, he's more of almost a divine, uh, type of thing. So when there's magic, there's actually like a, a God, uh, in the Lord of the Rings universe, uh, that is providing you know, like his servants with that magic. So, I mean, Gandalf is more than what he seems. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. You go and you read the, the Cimmerillion, which it would be nice if they actually, you know, brought that around properly, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to have to wrap up the show, I think, right there. I do have plans for what's going to happen in the next episode, but I definitely want Philip with me for some stuff. But uh, I've got down for a, a main topic, which we're actually going to talk something actually Disney next time. But it's... Uh, some interesting stuff that he actually inspired me from something he preached on. I was like, then, you know, that's an interesting topic. Uh, so that will be hopefully maybe next time. I am also working on having um, people come back to talk about get back to the future when they happen to be teenagers that are seeing it for the first time and their thoughts on that. I'm working on that. We're, we're hopefully going to have that very, very soon. Uh, and we don't have any more interruptions on a weekend where I can get recorded with it with said people. So uh, let me go ahead and remind you to go to my to neverlandpodcast.com where you're going to find the thing for my podcast reviews. I don't think it's been renamed yet, but you can click in there. If you happen to have a podcast, you want to get your reviews, you can get them sent right to your inbox. Uh, we want to thank Karen Kennedy, Ricky Pope of Christian Nerds Unite, and Darren, H- Darren Wilhite of the Wilhite and Wall Show for helping me out with the intro of the show. By the way, why are at NeverlandPodcast.com? I should probably go ahead and mention, you know, there's a Patreon link there, there's a shop there, and, and when you do stuff like that and you buy something or you become a patron, uh, you really do help me out. Plus, you're going to get some exclusive things including getting access to the show without the ads that uh, are placed in the show, because right now I'm trying to use ads to help pay for this. So... It, it, you know, it does cost me quite a bit to bring this, this show to you, and I do enjoy doing it, and uh, I like being able to share with you. And if you if you enjoy what we're doing here and you want to help me out to be able to share things with you, I appreciate that so much. Plus, of course, you can send us an email, podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. We do have a Twitter page, Neverland Pcast, a Facebook group, and a fan page that you can find by looking at Never Fort Neverland Podcast. I'm trying to make sure I'm posting a lot of fun stuff in the group, fun memes and things like that. Uh, you can become an official Neverlander on our website as well. It'll become a pixie or a lost boy. There'll be instructions right there. Uh, why don't we have lost girls? Because girls are too clever. They don't get lost. But now uh, that wraps up the show until next time. So now the only thing I've got to say to you is get lost. In an adventure! And we'll see you next time. <laughs>